chapter twenty three of the forbidden way by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva the intruder meanwhile in parlor a next door a lady in a pink kimono who seemed unusually diminutive and childish in her low-heeled bedroom slippers pottered about uneasily walking from window to window jerking at the shades to peer out of doors and then pulling the shades noisily down again opening the hall door looking down the corridor walking out a few steps and then coming rapidly back again to light a cigarette which she almost immediately put out and threw into the stove coughing dropping things and then standing tense and alert to listen acting altogether in a surprising and unusual manner but the sound of voices in the adjoining room persevered now loud now less loud but always perfectly audible through the thin paper-like partition at last as though in sudden desperation without removing her clothes or even her slippers she crawled quickly into bed and pulled the covers and pillow over her head lying still as a mouse but tense and alert in spite of herself and in spite of herself listening she emerged again in a while half smothered like a diver coming to the surface listening again and then with an exclamation quickly got out of bed her fingers at her ears to open the hall door presently and flee down the corridor from her vantage point in an empty room she heard jeff's rapid footsteps go past and only when she heard them no longer did she go back to parlor a she closed the outer door and locked it sat down in an armchair leaning forward her head in her hands staring at a pink rose in the ornate carpet deep in thought in the room next door all was quiet again once she thought she heard the sound of a sob but she could not be sure of it and after a while the light which had shone through the wide crack under the door disappeared for a long time she sat there immovable except for the slight quick tapping of one small foot upon the floor at last she rose with an air of resolution and touched the bell to the clerk who answered it in person she asked for telegraph blanks and a messenger he looked at his watch the telegraph office is closed well it will have to be opened this is a matter which can't wait until morning the operator must be found we might get a message through he looked at the bill she had put in his hands yes i'm sure we can and you might send me up some tea and toast she shut the door went to her trunk took out her writing pad put it on the table turned up the wick of the lamp and began writing she finished a letter and sealed it carefully when the telegraph blanks came she wrote two rather lengthy messages one of the telegrams was addressed to the cashier of the tenth national bank of denver the other telegram and the letter were addressed to lawrence berkeley at the brown palace hotel in the same city when she had given the messenger his instructions she sank in her chair again with a sigh and with a teacup in one hand and a piece of buttered toast in the other sat facing the door into parlor b her face wore a curious expression partly mischievous partly solemn but there was at times a momentary trace of trouble in it too and when the teacup was set aside she stretched her arms wearily and then brought them down lacing her fingers behind her neck putting her head back and closing her eyes as though in utter soul-racking weariness suddenly she rose passing the back of one wrist abruptly across her brows and prepared to go to bed camilla awoke late and ordered breakfast in her room it was not bodily fatigue which she felt now that seemed to have passed 
it was mental inertia which like muscular stiffness follows the carrying of too heavy a burden a part of her burden she still carried and even the brightness of the colorado sun which dappled the tinsel wallpaper beside her failed to rekindle the embers of old delights from one of her windows she could see the fine sweep of the sawatch range as it extended its great half-moon toward the northern end of the valley where it joined the main ridge of the continental divide from the other window the roofs of the town below her mulrennan's the schoolhouse and jeff's watch us grow sign now dwarfed by the brick office building which had risen behind it it seemed a hundred years since she had lived in mesa city and to her eyes accustomed to elegant distances the town seemed to have grown suddenly smaller more ugly garish and squalid and yet it was here that she had lived for five years five long years of youth and hope and boundless ambition in those days the place had oppressed her with its emptiness and she had suffered for the lack of opportunity to live her life in accordance with the dreams of her school days but to-day when she seemed to have neither hope nor further ambition she knew that the early days were days of real happiness what did it matter if it had been the bliss of ignorance since she was now aware of the folly of wisdom she could never be happy anywhere now not even here she lay back on her pillows and closed her eyes but even then the vision of rita cheyne intruded a vision of jeff and rita cheyne riding together over the mountain trails she was indeed unpleasantly surprised when a few moments later there was a knock upon the door at the foot of her bed and when she had put on a dressing-gown the door opened suddenly and there stood rita cheyne herself smiling confidently and asking admittance camilla was perturbed so much so in fact that no words occurred to her the door had opened outward toward rita cheyne who held its knob it was therefore obviously impossible for camilla to close it without mrs cheyne's assistance this it seemed the visitor had no intention of giving for she came forward on the door-sill and held out her hand mrs ray she said gently i want to come in and talk to you may i this is rather surprising camilla began yes she admitted it is perhaps i'm a little surprised too i i wanted to talk to you there are some things important things by this time camilla had managed to collect her scattered resources i'm not sure she said coolly that our friendship has ever been intimate enough to warrant rita put one hand up before her don't mrs ray it hasn't but you'll understand in a moment if you'll let me come in and talk to you camilla drew her laces around her throat and with a shrug stood aside i hope you'll be brief she said coldly will you sit down but mrs cheyne had already sat in a chair with her back to one of the windows where her face was partially obscured by the shadows of her hair she pulled her kimono about her figure clasped her fingers over her knees and leaned forward eagerly examining her companion who had seated herself uneasily upon the side of the bed you are handsome she said candidly as if settling a point in her own mind which had long been debatable i don't think i ever saw you handsomer than you are at the present moment trouble becomes you it gives a meaning to the shadows of your face which they never had before camilla started up angrily did you come here to comment upon my appearance no said rita suavely i can't help it that's all did you know that you have been the means of destroying one of my most treasured ideals you have you know i've always scoffed at personal beauty now i remain to pray it's a definite living force like politics or like religion really 
mrs cheyne please let me talk you would if you only knew what i'm going to say my remarks may seem irrelevant but they're not they're a confession of weakness on my part an acknowledgment of strength on yours you never liked me from the first and i don't think i really was very fond of you we seem to have been run in different moulds there's no reason why we shouldn't have got along because well you know i'm not half bad when one really knows me and you you have everything that most people like you're beautiful cultured clever and and quite human camilla made a gesture of impatience but rita went on imperturbably you're handsome gentle and human but you you're a dreadful fool and then with a laugh please sit down and don't look so tragic it's true dear perfectly true and you'll be quite sure of it in a moment anger seemed so futile camilla was reduced to a smile of contempt i'm sure i can't be anything but flattered at your opinions mrs cheyne but in spite of herself she was conscious of a mild curiosity as to whither this remarkable conversation was leading thanks said rita with mock humility there's only one thing in the world more blind than hatred and that's love because you think you hate me you'd be willing to let slip forever your only chance of happiness in this world i don't hate you said camilla icily and luckily my happiness is not in any way dependent on what you may say or do oh yes it is said rita quickly i'm going to prevent you from making a mistake you've already made too many of them you're planning to go away to kansas when your husband positively adores the very ground you walk on having shot her bolt like the skilful archer she put her head on one side and eagerly watched its flight camilla started up one hand on the bedpost her color vanishing you you heard i i know he told you who jeff she leaned back in her chair and laughed up at the ceiling well hardly i don't mind people telling me they adore the ground i walk on but how did you know camilla glanced toward the door and into mrs cheyne's room a new expression of dismay coming into her eyes you heard what passed in here last night yes something i couldn't help it how could you have listened camilla gasped i tried not to i tried to make you stop by dropping things and making a noise but i couldn't you didn't or wouldn't hear either of you finally i had to go out of the room she rose with a sudden impulse of sympathy and put her hand on camilla's shoulder oh don't think everything bad about me can't you understand won't you realize that at this moment i'm the best friend you have in the world even if you don't admit that try to believe that what i say to you is true why should i risk a rebuff in coming in here to you if it wasn't with a motive more important than any hurt you can do to me what i say to you is true your husband loves you he's mad about you don't you understand camilla lowered her eyes one of her hands fingering at the bed cover suddenly aware of the friendly pat on her shoulder at last she slowly raised her head and found rita cheyne's eyes with the searching intrusive look that one woman has for another why should you tell me this she asked mrs cheyne turned aside with a light laugh why shouldn't i is happiness so easily to be had in this world that i'd refuse it to a friend if it was in my power to give i can't see you throwing it away for a foolish whim that's what it is a whim you've got to stay with jeff what right do you have to go what has he done to deserve it i flirted with him i acknowledge it what is that i flirt with every man i like it's my way of amusing myself she straightened and with a whimsical smile which had in it a touch of effrontery the fact that he still loves you after that my dear she said is the surest proof of his devotion camilla looked away out of the window toward the watch us grow sign the symbol of jeff's ambition and her eyes softened 
she got up and walked to the window which faced the mountains if i could only believe you if i only could she said and then turning suddenly why did you try to make jeff fall in love with you rita shrugged simply because because it was impossible i'm so tired of doing easy things i've always done everything i wanted to and it bored me i owe your husband a debt i thought all men were the same do you really think there are any more like jeff camilla watched her narrowly probing shrewdly below the surface for traces of the vein of feeling she had shown a moment before what she discovered was little but that little seemed to satisfy her for after a pause in which she twisted the window cord and then untwisted it again she came forward slowly took rita by both hands and looked deep into her eyes why did you come out here it was no time for equivocation camilla's eyes burned steadily oh so steadily but rita did not flinch i thought jeff was lonely i thought he needed someone and so i came out in bent's private car as far as denver i left them there and came on alone i wanted to help him i'm trying to help him still with my sympathy my money and and such influence as i can use to make his wife realize her duty to him and her duty to herself it was an explanation which somehow did not seem to explain and yet curiously enough it satisfied camilla if it was not the whole truth there was nothing of it that was nothing but the truth she felt that it would not have been fair to ask for more rita was not slow to follow up this advantage she gave a quick sigh and took camilla by both shoulders you mustn't go away to kansas i tell you you've never loved anybody but jeff cortland knows it and i know it i've known it all the while a woman has a way of learning these things if you leave him now there's no telling what may happen he needs you he can't get on without you they're trying to crush the life out of him in this soulless war for the smelter and they may succeed he's pushed to the limit of his resourcefulness and his endurance flesh and blood can't stand that strain long he needs all his friends now and every help moral and physical that they can give him there's no one else who can take your place now no one to stand at his side and take the bad with the good you've had your half of his success now you must take your half of his failure you're his wife camilla do you understand that his wife a sob welled up in camilla's throat and took her unawares she bent her head to hide it and then gave way and fell on the bed in a passion of tears rita watched her for a moment with a smile for she knew that the tears were tears of happiness then went over and put her arms around camilla's shoulders murmuring gently you're not to blame camilla not altogether and it's not too late to begin again he needs you now as he has never needed you before it's your opportunity i hope you see it i do i do came faintly from the coverlid you must see him at once do you understand shall i send for him yes soon camilla sat up and smiled through her tears drew rita down alongside of her put her arm around her and kissed her on the cheek i understand you now i'm sorry for many things i want to know you better dear may i yes said rita calmly if you can perhaps then you might explain me to myself but i'm going to new york again soon something tells me you are to stay here i will stay here now said camilla proudly if jeff wants me are you sure sure he rita held her off at arm's length quizzically tantalizing her purposely no silly he loves me of course that's why i'm presenting him to you then she leaned forward kissed her on the cheek and rose quickly 
it's pretty late i must catch the eleven o'clock train i have a lot to do i'm going into my own room there was a knock at the outer door camilla answered it and received a note from the clerk from mr ray's office there's no answer she opened it hurriedly while rita watched dear camilla it ran i'm leaving suddenly by the early train for denver on a business matter which to me means either life or death for the love of god don't leave me now wait until i return i'm going to the brown palace hotel and will write you from there jeff she read through the hurried scrawl twice and then silently handed it to her companion you must follow camilla at once with me said mrs cheyne End of chapter 23